Good, okay, uh, Mayor Gray, so I'm just getting into the room now. Um, uh, and uh, it won't take long, just gonna wait for, wait for people to come in. We're, we're in there now, that's, which is great. Um, good, let's just make sure that's up as well. Excellent. Oh, great, hi, Mayor. Hello. <laughs> oh, good to see you again, and thanks for coming back to see us. Um, we're just gonna wait for people to come into the room. Uh, let me just put this up here. Uh, I'm going to move my phone so I'm not looking down. <laughs> hi, Danielle. So Danielle says hi. Uh, people hi. Come in so hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just back from my holiday in Greece. Uh, so I feel all kind of energised and relaxed. Um, so I've been really looking forward to this, Mayor, this evening. So just to let everybody know, um, Mayor's wearing a very different hat tonight, if you've seen it, Mayor talk in, in the group before. Uh, and um, uh, what I'm loving about what we're going to hear tonight is that May is going to present something to us very much from her point of view as um, a dog owner, guardian, caregiver, uh, uh, whilst looking at things through what uh, has come from um, your kind of trauma-informed lens, really, May. I think that's the, the way to kind of think about it. And I love how individuals listen to different things and mull things over and push things through their own filters and then come out with something very special. And I think that's definitely what, what's happened here, Mayor. And I know uh, you've been influenced by a lot, of, um, a lot of different people and you'll be referencing them tonight, of course, as part of this kind of thing. And uh, uh, I think what you're gonna offer us, because I've had a sneak peek, uh, <laughs> is a really good and succinct way for us to step back and make sure we're reappraising things between the difference between that kind of compliance model, relationship model, and especially the importance of that when we try and have a truly trauma-informed approach. Yeah. So is that a good little build-up for you, Maya? Have yeah. I, have, I got, have I got that right? <laughs> I think so. Uh, I think it would just be useful before we share the actual images of the wheels, because I know people are probably itching to see them by now, um, is just to explain a little bit of about the why and the how. So you've touched on, on bits there, but just in a little bit more depth. So if we very quickly rewind 10 years, so in between kind of 2012 and the present day, um, this is when I started working with trauma, working with survivors of trauma, uh, human survivors of trauma, um, and where my knowledge started in using a truly tra trauma-informed uh, approach and to kind of explain that a little bit, it does become relevant in the wheels. So when some say a survivor or a client, whatever you want to call them comes, it's about asking them, what's your story? What happened to you? And letting them tell you in, in, and actively listening and not putting judgments and not why did you do it that way? Why were you with that person? You know, what were you wearing? All those kinds of uh, bits and blaming statements. It's about saying, what's your story? I'm here to listen to you actively listening to what they're saying uh, and engaging with them on a human level and then the three key things post that is validating their experience so I believe you it's not your fault you didn't deserve it and then the second biggest thing is what can I do for you now what are your needs your specific needs as an individual and how can I help so not I've listened to you and this these are what I believe your needs are and now this is the options available to you and I want you to do this one. It's what can I do for you and letting them be in control of their own resilient, their, um, you know, recovery. So that's where I started. Fast forward six, seven years. So rewinding three years is almost three years ago now in July is when I came home with Podrick. So eight week old Border Collie puppy, uh, my first ever dog um, as an adult. Like I was just, solely responsible for so I grew up with dog, dogs and we uh, fostered dogs but we you know mum took care of us <laughs> yeah I wasn't the primary caregiver my ex-partner had a border collie um for like three or four years I was with him but again not the primary caregiver so as a an autistic person and as someone who's a type a perfectionist <laughs> as a trauma response I wanted to get it right and I think that phrase is something that you guys hear a lot is I want to get it right I want to get it right for my dog and Four weeks before I brought Podrick home, I remember just frantically panicking. I don't know anything. I'm like going to ruin their life. And I was researching. I'm someone who, if in doubt, I go to reading, <laughs> research. So I was watching lots of different things. And 
as someone who wasn't involved in the dog world, you know, I'm watching, say, a YouTube, a, a YouTube from, say, a well-known positive trainer. Underneath that is a recommended of, say, a well-known adversive trainer. But I don't know the difference of a, a new dog person. So I'm watching all these things. And I'm then filtering that through my internal moral code and work life that I've had the, the last 10 years. So I've got that filter. No one's telling me this is an adversive trainer, but I'm questioning that because of how I am as a person. And I remember, I'm going to go into too much detail to like what books I read or whatever, but I remember the first book I ever read was Easy Peasy Puppy Squeezy by Steve Mann, which is obviously a very good book and it's very well recommended, but it's very much a training book about kind of training. And that didn't really satisfy me because I wanted to know what, made, what would make my dog tick. I wanted to know why dogs do certain things. Um, so the second book I ever read, which really made me have that click with my past and you know, my work with dogs, was Patricia McConnell, McConnell's, went a bit Harry Potter then, Patricia yeah. McConnell's, um, On the Other End of the Leash, which, you know, is an older book now, um, but I mean, I was just blown away, I remember I was audio, listening on audio on the commute, and I just was absolutely fascinated, and that was where the rabbit hole, dog rabbit hole, went really in, and then after her, I read her second book, which is The Education of Will, and in that book, she specifically talks about her dog's trauma, so Will's trauma, who's also a border collie, and her trauma as a sexual abuse survivor. So I was able to, you know, see both of my worlds come really easily and combine almost like a lock and key um, sparks went in my brain. Um, and then I got Podrick, I brought him home and um, I took him to the vet for his vaccinations, whatever. And that's when I met Trisha Collinshead, who is here today. So I've known, known Trisha since literally almost, I had Project Back three days <laughs> and I met Trisha for like, and she was running these pre-puppy classes, but not in a training sense. She was doing that work as trying to get us as, as dog owners to understand but the behaviour behind it um, and kind of get us on the right track before we'd even started puppy classes. And um, you got one free session with Trish. <laughs> so you got the class and then you got one free one-to-one -one with her. And she's not got rid of me since the one to one. And she's really, I said to you before, like if I was going to credit one being, it would be Podrick first and foremost, because he's been the biggest teacher in, you know, in terms of my being the first dog, also struggling himself with, with his own individual needs and truly understanding like what that means as a dog as an individual. But the actual first human being, I would credit Trish because she'd just been so generous with her time and knowledge and uh, experience. And, and then from meeting her, I was able then to run everything through my past knowledge, my current knowledge, including what she was telling me. So then I, would, I did puppy, puppy school um, and all those kinds of other things. But I was still stuck when I first got pod, the first six-ish months really still stuck in this to get it right I need to do everything on this checklist that I've been given on socialization I need to like x amount of hours you know at a Tesco car park, you know with the trolley and like all this kind of thing and I remember just one day sitting in a field with him and just being with him and I remember telling someone and she was kind of like well what are you doing it's a waste of time like you've you've got critical windows and you've got all these things and I'm like well I felt a bit ill that day and I, you know, that kind of thing. So you st I, the, re the, the wheels came about because I was engaging with this material and I had my own internal code, as I said. Um, and I'm a visual learner. So for me, it was like, okay, I'm going on courses, like your course I came on. I've been on courses previously, lots of body language ones, blah, blah, blah. Reading all these like cool books. Um, and I just wanted a visual for myself, really. So the wheels were originally developed for me, <laughs> myself and I. Um, I showed them to Trisha. They've been through lots of different drafts. So the ones that you're going to see today is not what they looked like at the beginning. At the beginning, I was very focused on tools, like too focused on tools, too focused on, again, training, just like that kind of element. Um, and they went through draft, 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 and then they got left. So I just was like, I can't, I need time to, think about this then I came on your workshop and I credit that as the as I said to you before that clicking again and I came on the workshop and I think within three or four days 
post workshop they were like almost complete so I showed them again to Trish and I've showed them to you and there was some tweaking but really that was to connect the dots so um, that's now what we're going to see today so that's kind of the background story to the wheels and I think it is important as I said when I was talking to you before that you know we say that I'm not here today as a dog expert or a dog qualified dog behaviorist or I'm here as a passionate dog parent um, that cares a lot about that personal connect, connect the connection with dogs. Um, but I don't think I'm knowledge less, if that's a word, with regards to dogs. I'm just not, that I've got limitations and I'm very happy to put my hands up with regards to those. There's pod. There's <laughs> iPod. I think, um, I think this is important though, babe, because uh, the only real experts are the dogs, right? And yeah. I think we all we all have we all have a knowledge and a, an experience and a skill set. And I think we kind of need sometimes people to come in with a um, a good fundamental knowledge base on on behaviour more generally, and especially that inform a, a trauma informed lens that you, that you talk about. Uh, but who can look at things with a, a freshish pair of eyes? I think it's really important too. And we can quite often get kind of stuck and get bogged down in in our own kind of uh, outlooks. And uh, it's nice to, as I said at the beginning, it's good to have somebody look at things and put it through their own filter. And, and you've come up with something that I think is is very clean. It's very um, it's very accessible, uh, and it's a good way to put these things over. And especially something you mentioned there about um, about the choices we have really when you look at trying to invite somebody to let us know what we can do to support them as opposed to actually telling them their choices. This is one thing about the compliance side of things. It isn't necessarily about things being done in a kind of uh, nefarious or malicious way. It's quite often it's just because I'm gonna project my idea of safety onto you. I know what's safe, therefore you must do that, Mayor. So I'm trying to be Kind of helpful but actually i'm yeah. not bearing witness to what your truth is regarding your need for safety and i think that's a really important thing that we all have to reevaluate sometimes mm. in in my sector we have changed that last model so that's strength based so when i first see someone we say what strengths do you already have what are your resilience so if you're if you say you have been in an abusive relationship and you're able to effectively parent that's a resilience so it's really taking strength down to its core uh, what, what that means so it's strength based needs led so what are your needs and how can I help you meet your needs rather than my my perception of what your needs are mm. um trauma informed so you know having a good understanding of what uh trauma is how it happens how to come back from it and then empowering and you know I think that could easily be just lifted and like put put down it in you know not completely exactly the same but I think all four of those things should be looked at when working with dogs as just as much as humans yeah. and i think a lot of what's been going on with this uh also, i don't want to use the word new because obviously there's a lot of amazing people uh trish is one of them and uh and others who've been talking about things beyond training if you like for, for a while but i think a lot of the discussions that are going on especially in dog center care group um uh you've managed to kind of bring a lot of that discussion into something and say it's quite it's quite simple really it's a, mm. it's a good way to graphically see things and make us think oh let me have a think about that and I find it myself that you know uh, especially on the compliance world we'll have a look at that in a minute uh, two things is one that um, recognizing that actually there are times when I'm in that compliance wheel and I'm aware of it mm. and that's okay it's just being honest about what we're expecting at that time yeah but there are also times when I need to remind myself that I've slipped into the compliance wheel and be aware of that because we can easily slip into that side without being aware of it and this is this this whole model for me is just about allowing us in a graphic way to help that awareness and stay more aware of what we're doing actually at the time. I think for, for me it's it's about questioning always and and I, I and I think it's natural for me because as a person I look at everything through a critical lens um but one of my flaws probably as well as the strength but I think all all the wheels are asking that's all that they're asking us to do it they're not here as like a prescriptive you know to get this you need to do every single thing within every single section and all that it's just about giving people the knowledge to be able to, to 
filter through their own moral code. So yeah. if if that fits well, sits well with you, then we're not here. We can't tell you what to do. Do you know it's that that's not the point either. It's yeah. it's just um, like you say, a, more of an easier way of just doing that questioning, I, I suppose. Well then, good. I think uh, I think we set the scene. Well, we have, yeah. yeah. Um, let's do um, it. <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. Um, I, I suppose we've touched on it, but just to to reiterate that we're not saying anything new. <laughs> there are references on the wheels um, where to people that I personally know. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking is toy. Um, the you know so. I'm not saying that only these people are saying these things. These are just people that I've personally engaged with or have followed. So it's not about excluding other people that may have contributed to things that we're going to say, but it's just that, these, that they're on there for a specific reason. I think that's really important to say as well, that we're not, that I've tried to credit as much as possible where I've gotten the ideas from. Um, um, and that, like you were saying there about the compliance wheel is that it's not necessarily directed at the people who are watching today that the wheels are they're for everyone so therefore your average pet dog owner guardian whatever you want to call them they're for pet professionals as well but it's it, it's not targeting any specific um, person saying this is what you do and it's wrong it's just like you said that overall model and so, one thing yeah. important little point on that is that, uh, one of the main things of the group really is the democratization of these conversations and uh, and uh, the validity of multiple voices. Mm. Um, we need our, our input from our academic science-based people who are uh, specialized in kind of companion animal behavior and neuroscience and else, and also um, kind of everyday folk who are living with animals that they have uh, connected to and learned from and, uh, and and everybody in between. And I think this is very much your contribution and I think it's valid for that. Uh, and uh, and this is definitely a safe space to want to share. So Trisha's getting very- I know, impatient. Yeah, she wants to see, everyone wants to see. So uh, yeah, so- Let's please, share my let's screen. I hope, let's let's try and hopefully um, you can say if you, when you see them. Yeah, we're up. Uh, on my screen anyway. The notes, just... the notes aren't there. Uh, no, know. no. Oh, so, awesome. okay. And it's up on Facebook the same as well. So that's good. Excellent. So I'm not gonna so it only shows the person speaking. So I'm gonna shut up now yeah. and let you get on with it. Okay. So I think first of all it's uh important to just explain the the makeup of the wheels. So in the middle of the compliance wheel you have compliance and that's kind of the the reasoning for why we're doing the training or why we're, how we're engaging with the dog and what we want from them is at the center of each of the wheels. So you've got compliance at the center of this wheel and partnership at the center of the partnership wheel. Um, like you, like, uh, so if you look then at the outside, you can see it's off, I've put often unconscious and often unintentional. Um, and that's to signify, you know, we're not talking here about people who use aversive methods and know that know that they're causing harm etc cetera, etc cetera. they're not what who the wheels are for because they would come under something else this is for people who through society or through norms or through pressure have been told that in order to get a good dog or in order to get um you know the dog that they want that that dog needs to be you can probably replace compliance with the with the term obedient or any of any of those types of uh, words. So that's why often unintentional and often unconscious are on the outside as well. And then you have pressure. So that's kind of the method. So that, and then you've got physical and emotional pressure. So physical is literally what it means. So physical pressure. So that could be things like, uh, that could come down to tools. It could come down to physically using uh, the body or, you know, hands to create pressure to get the dog to do what you want to do or it could be emotional or psychological pressure. Um, does that make sense, Andy? Yes. <laughs> You're gonna yes. be my touchstone for like, if I'm what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so, so that's always on the outside of the wheel. So that's kind of the how. And then within within you've got the four, sec, uh, the four subsections. So prepotent leadership, distortion of perspective reality, over-reliance on training and insecure attachment. 
um, and we're going to go through what's within each. So prepotent means, because um, it's a word that I picked that I didn't even know existed before I picked it, um, it means greater than others in power or influence. So they come from the belief that as the human, I know more than the dog, um, and that's that kind of hierarchy. So uh, because I know more than the dog, my perspective is the right one and how um, how I choose to interact is is because I'm uh, you know higher up and I've got more knowledge and all that kind of thing. So if we look at a uh, proposed leadership section first, I'll pop all of the bullet points up and then Andy and I can kind of go through them. So the, so things that would come under prepotent leadership are things like not appreciating the dog as an emotional being or reject completely rejecting the fact that dogs have emotions, as we know uh, some people do. Uh, doesn't listen to the dog or ignores their communi their, them communicating physical or emotional discomfort, instead believing that they know what's best. Expectation of unconditional compliance uh, or obedience at all times in all situations. Um, so that's, you know, in any situation, uh, at all times, the dog must do what we ask them to do or tell them to do. Um, where some people might use the dog as an ego boost or, or a tool where dog, the dog's actual needs come second. Um, so, so an example of that might be things like shows for some people, not saying everyone that shows their dog, you know, um, it is doing it for that, but things like shows and sports, sometimes we can, we can definitely see that. Um, and they have a limited understanding of natural canine behavior slash body language. So, um, and this, was where I had a really great conversation with Trisha because she 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 mentioned so that so at first I didn't have natural in there and it was just limited understanding of canine behavior but because of the years and years of what we think we know and um how we've seen through we we lots of general dog people as in the general public they don't understand that like what they're actually seeing is unnatural dog body language anymore because that's all they've ever seen does that make sense then yes so so i'm thinking here of like the tiktok videos where it's like very clear to a lot of us that the dog's uncomfortable but because it's been normalized by humans that that actually means that they're happy you know so so they think they understand but they don't so that's why we added natural um, into it i don't know if you want to add anything to this section first no, I think it's just, uh, yeah, you're covering it really well, Maya. Okay, I think distortion, is, oh no, over-reliance is next. So uh, over-reliance on training, Andy, you'll definitely have lots to say about this because you were key um, in, in my understanding of this. I think first, before we even go into the bullet points, we're not saying that training is bad inherently. No, it says a typo there with training, but we're not saying that training's bad and that we shouldn't do training and um, all that kind of thing. We're not saying that. What we're saying is, at the moment, in some situations, there seems to be an over-reliance on training. Um, and because an over-reliance on training tends to link to compliance, so I want my dog to do this. So that's the compliance. How I get that is by training them. Um, and without kind of understanding that the reason for the dog's behavior is often that there's a need not being met or there's an emotional element being um, ignored there. So if you go through the bullet point, so uh, the, the pr prioritization is on training rather than meeting underlying needs. Um, they might use tone, body language that the dog may perceive as threatening. I think that's really important that we understand the perception. So as human beings, we might not mean to be threatening towards the dog, but if the dog perceives it as threatening, it's still threatening. So things like raising our voice, and, and again, this is individual to the dog, so I'm not saying all of these things. So things like raising your voice, changing tone, pointing fingers, invading their personal space without their consent or touching them without their consent, all of those types of things would go in there. The focus is on commands, cues and artificial behaviours, plus a massive focus on outcome, which um, Andy speaks a lot about. So, for example, tricks. And we're not saying tricks are bad. <laughs> I feel like I have to qualify everything with we're not saying that they're bad, um, but it's when, um, when they like negatively impact the natural behavior of the animal um so things like waiting for food um as well could come under there so the focus is on the outcome rather than helping 
someone through an emotional experience that they're having it's I want to get to the outcome so it's very quick normally with the compliance well everything's done I want this done now or I want it done within a time frame and I want you to tell me the time frame and it has to be within you know a very short time it doesn't allow the dog processing time it doesn't allow them to do it in their own time um or at all it doesn't often give them the option to say no at all um uh, and then uh, training methods use often punishment pressure or coercion based I've purposefully not put specific tools on the wheels so you'll see even on the partnership wheels wheel it doesn't mention tools because it's not about getting sucked into a this tool is better than this tool and R plus is better than this and all that kind of thing Every, anything and everything can be coercive if it's you depending on the way that it's used and the reason that it's used um, so and, and that's where that's I think that that's where that self-awareness that you were talking about at the beginning Andy really comes in it's understanding that just because you're not using a prong collar doesn't mean that sometimes what you're asking isn't actually co coercive I think that's really important and this is what I like about <clears throat> having really simply put into these kind of wheels and uh, I don't think we need to keep um it's really tempting, isn't it, to keep having to uh, kind of quantify things. Uh, but I'll just support what you said, you know, it's important that people just look at this information uh, and take what it take from it what they need. And I think uh, I use uh, I use the term task and care. Mm. And that and task is very much about compliance to a point. Now, I think that's uh, and we can be very um, easily in in that kind of compliance uh, mindset without necessarily knowing it. And, and this is about us uh, uh, inviting us all to be more aware in those moments. You know, am I asking my dog to do something to that nth degree because I'm stuck in task, because I'm kind of stuck on that compliance wheel Brilliant. without recognizing whether the animal can or should be doing it? Yeah. Um, uh, and I think uh, the thing is about, you know, the, there's a thread going on in Dog Center Care at the moment about the, the use of food. And of course, we use food. I, I use food myself. Um, uh, but uh, it's being honest, I think, about are we using whatever method or tool in order to get the dog to do something? Because that's our primary objective. Or have we engaged in a more collaborative process with the dog to try and work out what behaviors that we support? might have more value to that dog and actually be able to support a regulatory framework for that dog yeah 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 um and i think we said and i don't know if we said at the beginning but we're going to do kind of a brief overview of all four of the wheels so if people are interested and want then we can do more we can schedule in more talks to zone in on sections or we can do a whole talk on the compliance wheel so if people really want to do a deep dive, we can do that. It's just with the time we've got today to do four of them. Um, we're not going to do that so much today. Um, so we move on to distortion of perspective reality. So what we mean by that is our expectations of dogs. Are they realistic? Um, and where are they informed from? Which which I'm so excited to show you the, uh, the extended wheel because that, that really shows how the norms and traditions and um, what we have been told for years about dogs comes into individuals' distortion of perspective and reality. So that's where we have an expectation of dogs to understand our language and expectations without attempting to learn theirs. Believes that the dog should respect them. So to, where I put quote is, is that language where we, where, which we see quite a lot. So things like respect them and when they don't conform, then they're labelled as naughty dogs, stubborn dogs manipulative dogs or should know better which I actually heard someone say for the first time in real life the other day and um, it really made me you know um, step back and was like wow people really do um, still think that you know that without any so I've, I've heard it with puppies like you know they should know better and it's like well they've literally been alive maybe <laughs> not that long um so how how are they supposed to know better have you taught them or or are we just relying on them apparently knowing so I remember going to um, I remember going to like a show thing. It was like a border collie herding trial type thing with Pod when he was about like four and a half months old, maybe. Um, and he's a big dog. He's always been quite um, a big uh, border collie, and um, he's excitable. And he was in a new place and lots of things. And he loves to speak to people. <laughs> speak to people. What to say? Like, so he struggled a lot with jumping up, and he struggled a lot with, you know. Um, 
being very excitable. And that's that's who he is. Um, and I remember someone said to me that, you know, that dog's going to control your life um, and they should know better. And he's like, at this point, four, yeah, like four and a half minutes old. Um, so it, it's definitely, and I think the biggest thing for me is the wheels are written from the dog's point of view. We can't separate the fact that the human end of the league also feels pressure um, from society and from other people to, to, to conform. I think I, I was able to resist purely because I had that moral code that I spoke about right at the beginning. It was, it was very easy for me. And also having literally worked as an advocate for humans to say no and just be firm in that. But that doesn't mean that I didn't drive home thinking, you know, was she right and all these kinds of things. Um, so I think acknowledging that is important. And then we come on to like one of the, you know, more well-known things. So the reliance on myths and outdated knowledge, such as dominance theory, which is just, you know, pervasive use of things like balance training, earn to learn training, um, and again, rejects dogs as having emotional needs. Anything you want to add to that subsection? Uh, no, but I, I need to say that it's a big part of it, of course, because perception is everything. And yeah. uh, the human end of the lead, their perception of need, on care, on behavior is really important. And that's the same for us as professionals as well you know our perception of what behavior is and how we should or shouldn't influence behavior is really important and uh if you uh if we don't allow ourselves to fundamentally uh kind of re uh reevaluate our view of behavior we can't fully see a bigger picture and i think that's important yeah. And I think, you know, this, this is where, where the often unconscious and often unintentional comes back in, because if you've been told, so like when, when I when I first, you know, picked up Pod, fresh eight weeks old, and I knew nothing, if I had accidentally gone, luckily the first people that I had contact with when I brought him home were people that understood the emotional experience and used positive training. We're not going to go too much into positive training. If I had, as not me, but as just a general dog owner, pet parent, first contact had been with an aversive trainer we trust authorities as human beings so if you say to me I've done all these uh, courses and I've done all this and I'm qualified to tell you this but it's all aversive I'm not going to necessarily question that so if I've been told that dominance theory exists and that's uh, and all these things that are in distortion of perspective and reality then you are acting unconsciously and unintentionally because you don't have the, the alternative knowledge yet and that, I feel like that's really important to keep bringing back to that lots of people do this, but they love their dogs. It's not about, oh, I don't love my dog. They love their dog, but they just have a, tiny, a small square of what they've been told and they run with it because we, we have trust in the people that are supposed to tell us how, how, to, how, to, how to be. That, and that also is uh, the same when we go through our education as well, because there are yeah, some absolutely. educational providers out there that are more up to date than others, of course. And, and this is why I, I put together my work, my workshop, because um, I just wanted to kind of invite people to rethink behavior period, really, you know, because um, yeah. we're it's all kind of unlearning. It is unlearning because we're all indoctrinated into a very set view of behavior, aren't we? That good to bad continuum. A lot of us go through a structured educational system. A lot of us are expecting our kind of round pegs to go into a conformist uh, sorry, square pegs going to a conformist round hole. So we've already got all those layers already built up before we even start thinking about how we're relating to or communicating with our dogs. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Uh, and then lastly, on uh, the last section is fostering, again, unintentionally and often unconsciously, an insecure attachment. Um, and that, that can roll into uh, damaging the relationship. So that are things like, Oh gosh, click too fast. Uh, so those are things like unrealistic expectations on the dog, for example, for their age, their individual ability or their breed, um, not fostering an emotional connection with the dog. And that may be because they don't know how, and that's okay. It's, it's just um, on there, but it's not fostering an emotional connection with the dog. Prevent, preventing access to companionship. Um, so I think that might be things like um, I've heard or seen loads of people, you know, people are like, well, the dog's only allowed in one area of the house because I don't want the rest of the house to get dirty. 
I'm not in that section of the house, um, but I know that they want to be with me, but I'm preventing them being with me and how that can have a negative impact on their uh, relationship, for, for example. Um, not providing safety and security. So the dog does not feel safe, not safe environmentally and emotionally with that person. Places pressure on them to perform and achieve. And that's in everything that we're asking. And that's not just sports shows, etc. That's in anything that we're asking them to do. Um, rejecting their requests for comfort or connection um, and inconsistency, um, which is, is you know, very confusing, um, which we do see quite often within families where there are you know, multiple people that are responsible for the dog um, because one person might get it more than another and how the, the tasks relating to the dogs are shared, you know, um, but how that can foster an insecure attachment. Anything to add now? I uh, know, that's really good. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited for the, so we're gonna go move on to the extended compliance bill, which is um, actually like one of my favorite bits because it looks at the bigger picture. So here we've zoomed right in to the individual person and their individual dog or dogs. Now we're gonna go out a little bit and we're gonna look at what, a little bit about why people have or why people do what they do within the compliance wheel. So, as you can see in the middle, you've got the compliance wheel as it was on the previous screen. And then we're gonna look at what influences people into acting how they do within the compliance wheel. So I think with culture comes up first. So our overriding culture uh, and what feeds into that. So our values around dogs, our norms around dogs, our traditions, our laws. So uh, things like dogs as property come, come into that. The good bad continuum, which you talk about Andy. Uh, norms again, traditions, laws. I think that they just repeat. Language, so la the language that we use. Tools and equipment, and again, I didn't compartmentalize these. These, it's not about saying tools or equipment are good or bad. It's about saying why do we? What's the reason for using them, and are they used in a coercive way? And language again. Um, so when we look at our dog, dog as an individual, we are influenced from, from the culture around us, and we're, uh, we're influenced by the institutions that we engage with. And institutions are things like trainers behaviorists like uh, you guys and I put including TV and social media trainers because so much of what the general public see and believe about dogs and dog behavior and dog training does it comes from engaging with TV shows and with TikTok trainers and Instagram trainers and Facebook trainers. Um, and that's not saying Again, you know, like lots of people have uh, have uh, Facebook pages. It's not about saying that that's bad. It's just saying that how people get their information has changed over the years, um, and some of it is uh, not necessarily the best. So I'll give an example. I follow, and I'm in a lot and lot of dog groups. When I'm scrolling through kind of Facebook lots because the algorithm doesn't distinguish between who I actually like and want to hear more from and dog training generally I see a lot of aversive trainers on my re on like when I'm scrolling down um because I'm like I said because a lot of us have that lens now that we can reject that like, that's not what I want to do other people can't do that because they they may not have that um and I, I won't name names because I don't want to get not other than they could, but you know what I mean? I won't name names, but I'm sure we can all think of people that we see on TV, we see on social media that have a lot of followers um, and they don't spout what we're trying, uh, what we're battling with. So uh, that's why I've included them in there, but uh, in their own bracket. Um, things like daycare and dog walkers, you know, what is the level of knowledge that the person that we send our dogs to daycare have? What kind of knowledge do our walkers have? You know, in, if we look at kind of regulations around it, daycare, uh, dog daycare is supposed to have some regulations in terms of council, etc. question mark, whether it's effective or not. And then walkers, literally anyone can say they want to be a dog walker. They don't have to have any sort of certification or knowledge. Of, so you get a lot of dogs thrown together because it's convenient. They might live in the same area. Is that good for each of the individual dogs? Sometimes not. Um, but we trust 
that they're an institution we trust we trust them educating bodies so there are your things you know your imdt apbc all those kind of ed anywhere you can go to get some sort of uh, education on, on dogs uh grooming and health so your canine massage therapist your hydrotherapist your groomers um, they they all you know have their own um, you know their own training and their own lens in which they look at things through and that they might tell uh, they might say things again not good or bad or anything like that but that they say things to their clients their clients which may for, inform how the clients act through the compliance wheel uh, rescue self-explanatory again so breeders again uh, welfare organisations governing bodies vets assistance and service uh, at dog sports and shows so it's not about pinpointing it the institutions are just fact that they are the institutions that influence either one way or the other way so it's not about targeting anyone specifically it's just saying these are what influence people and their and their relationship with dogs anything you want to add to this one andy no, I think it just goes to show. Um, I say no, and then I start talking. But anyway, um, the uh, it shows how much he's involved here, and <clears throat> how many different kind of factors are at play when we start thinking about uh, the different core component parts of the wheels, mm. <clears throat> and how for the general end user, you know, that that kind of caregiver, the, the general public, uh, how many influences there are on them. And if yeah. that influence still keeps supporting that task oriented outlook, that compliance based outlook, um, and it's kind of everywhere, right? I think uh, you only have to look at some of the TV shows and uh, some of the stuff like say, especially on social media. Yeah. Um, it's just a lack of awareness, I think, for a lot of a lot of the general public. Absolutely. And I think this is where, for me, I truly believe that we should extend our empathetic approach from the dog to the human being that's there with the dog that you're working with um, because I see a lot of uh, judgment often on dog owners dog guardians pet parents that I feel is often misplaced because when you look at this wheel you get the pressure that's on them as well and I think you have to recognize that the, the pressure is on them to have a good dog that's a good bad continuums on there and what they what they understand as a good dog is what they've been told or what they've seen on tv or whatever or what they grew up with so it's about like just expanding that empathetic non-judgmental outwards you know as well that's, that's important because the general public uh this is my view but uh has been convinced by lots of different things that are on this wheel here that the most important thing is a well-trained obedient yeah. dog yeah uh and um so everything then becomes a training issue for them even though so the dog might be trying to communicate need or communicate self but they see it as a training issue because it falls out of the remit of what they are stuck in which is that task oriented compliance based outlook uh yeah. and um uh many people in the dog center care group who are caregivers owners um guardians uh I've gone down the train more, train poor, try and get more compliant, try and get more compliant, and yeah. then realized actually I need to go down more of a relationship model, which we're going to come on to a minute, more of a, I need to listen first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're told that in order to get it right, like I said at the beginning, this is what you have to do to get it right. Um, and ultimately, that means that as pet parents, in a way, we're, we're like with many things, these are adapted you can see at the bottom these are adapted from the Duluth parent control and equality wheel so it's it's you could use this model on lots of different social issues um and what you what you end up seeing with the extended wheels is that societal years and when it's a years and years and years decades long you're it's not as simple as oh we'll just tell them that this is the right way and they're just going to follow it blindly because you're battling against decades and decades of them being told the opposite yeah. um so we we all have to take so it's not about i'm not saying that pet parents should just be given a free pass because at the same time we're all individually responsible for our own knowledge and seeking out knowledge and having an open mind so it's not about taking accountability away from them but it's about 
extending kindness <laughs> to towards um, you know the dog owners as well, which is often missing or often I see it not being extended as much as maybe it should be. And um, to each other as professionals, I think. I think uh, yeah, oh, yeah, or, or not. And, uh, but I think this is important because I think um, uh, if we just uh, we we need to go through a process of supporting people's awareness to actually see care and support needs as they are because many many people once once they know it they, well, I didn't realize actually that wasn't a sign of my dog being naughty that was actually a sign of my dog being stressed yeah they just didn't know it but if we start thinking about okay let's get this dog to stop barking here's how we're going to do it it doesn't matter whether it's well, it does matter I know but whether <laughs> it's done positively or punitively isn't kind of the point the point is there is potentially some relief seeking element for that dog yeah. with the barking in the first place. And if we don't help the owners uh, communicate better to the caregivers, uh, they're just gonna get stuck in task again, regardless of the tools or methods. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we have a look at the partnership wheel then? Cause this yes, is where please. it gets this really nice. Good. This is a nice bit. <laughs> so um, it follows the same model as the compliance wheel. So in the center, you have what, what people are seeking with their dog so instead of compliance or obedience here they're wanting and seeking partnership from each other so it's reciprocal the, the main bit at the top and the bottom is collaboration so that's actually having you know that's that like asking not telling and checking in and all those kinds of things um and then if and then you go connection which is on there as well so it's about building connection acting in collaboration seeking consent as much as we're able to, using compassion and empathy in our approach um, and protecting um, our dogs from, as far as we possibly can, from having negative experiences or being put in positions where they have to make cho choices or they have, to, or that they don't have any other choice but to do X behavior. So it's about protecting them emotionally and physically um, as individuals. Um, and then the four kind of subsections here, they kind of mirror the compliance world, but obviously the opposite. Um, so instead of proponent leadership, we've got benevolent guidance. Um, and that means things such as accepting dogs as emotional beings. So accepting that they do have emotions, setting them up for success as much as possible. Uh, understanding communication, so having that knowledge of dog body language and behaviour. You don't have to be, you know, a qualified behaviourist to know the basics around dog body language and behaviour. There's lots of resources out there, so it should be a, a set standard kind of thing for, for a certain amount of knowledge. If you've got a if you've got a dog, then you should kind of know a little bit about how they talk to you. It shouldn't just be one way, which is what's on the compliance um, wheel. Uh, giving our dogs agency and choice and respecting their decisions. So I added agency after I went to a talk that Laura Donaldson did and it really made me like think because it was on safety and you were there Andy. I think agency in a way is a lot a better phrase than choice, although interchangeably, because we were asking our dogs to live in what I call the human fishbowl um, I know that um, there's lots of discussions at the minute around, you know, dogs as captive animals and all those kinds of things. And Kim Brophy talks about it a lot. So when I, when I think about if you live in a fishbowl, there's only so many choices you can actually make because the, your true control isn't actually there. Um, so that's why I really liked her use of the term agency. So it's about giving our dogs as much agency within that human fishbowl as we possibly can. Um, and asking them, when we want them to do something, asking them and respecting their decision if they don't want to do it right then or, or if they're telling us in some other way that they're not comfortable, that we respect the decision. And that's where that coercive element comes in because sometimes people can be like, oh, they don't, they don't want to do it. I won't make them do it but I'll, I'll like help them with treats. So I think you used the, the, the car analogy or, or the thing that you did, and that's where it comes in. It's like, well, they, so Andy, tell the story about the car, because I think it's a good one. 
Uh, I'm not sure which story that is. Is that, is that, why, is that using free work around the car? Is it, is I think you said. I think you said that the dog didn't want to get in the car, but instead of not just. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, 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 no, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know, yeah. So I saw this on. Uh, it was a video I saw actually with um, a dog that didn't want to get into the car, but uh, the the handler was when the dog was putting you know putting the brakes on if you like they were stopping and then they said to camera you know this is that's giving the dog choice the dog has a choice not to not to keep moving forwards um and uh but the dog wasn't being given the choice about not going into the car ultimately uh the dog was just kind of deciding you know they, they were listening to the dog about not moving forwards but this is the thing about being that compliance or that task mode because the rest of the video, again, using food to do this uh, primarily, but uh, was to get the dog in the car. So the dog didn't really have a choice ultimately because the bottom line is that dog was going to end up in the car. Uh, and I think that I used about uh, using something like free work, which is what I tend to use um, around the car to give the dog the chance to jump in and jump out if they want to and they can do whatever they want. There's no expectation in that session that the dog has to end up in the car. So yeah. I think that's an example of the two approaches really. Yeah, and definitely this notion of choice because the dog had a choice in that moment about stopping, great, but ultimately that dog's destiny had already been decided, which is you're going to end up in the car. Yeah, yeah, and for, for me it's like okay, you you ultimately may need them to end up in the car because you may need to go to the vet, etc., etc., etc. But can we just slow this down? Because remember I said that the other wheel it's fast, it's like fast, fast. So in a ten minute video you've gone from there to there well, can we not do this over a shorter period of time? You know, can it? Can we listen a little bit more and, and uh, use the approach that that individual dog needs? Um, and I so think that, that's that a, is, sorry, sorry, Andy, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, I think that's a key point, isn't it? Because I think a lot of stuff with dog training more generally has move to doing things faster how do we get this behavior quicker how do we how do we get this to happen faster or sooner uh and a lot of this discussion here is about doing it the opposite which is like really slowing things down and yeah. and finding out what that dog needs in order to be able to have the time and the space to process what is being expected of them and to be able to say actually i can do that now or actually i can't do it now or i can do this which looks a little bit like that but i can't do that yet yeah uh, and well, i might never be able to do it Exactly. And I think that's something that's really important because um, uh, the last bit, especially, I think, Mayor, with a lot of dogs where a lot of work's done, a lot of work's done, and then the last bit, it's just like, oh, you're going to have to have this last bit done, and that's it. Uh, and, and I think especially with some situations, especially dogs who struggle to navigate the social environment you know, um, uh, and struggle with social engagement, I think it's important to bear witness to some of these dogs who, who really genuinely can't do some things. Yeah. And that that's okay, and to find ways of accommodating that as part of a wider social picture. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, the, the, given the see, focusing focuses on fostering bond and connection, encourages dog to fulfil natural behaviours, so things like sniffing, digging, chewing, sufficient time resting, play, and being as far as possible within the fish. <laughs> guided by the dog in how much you know when they want to rest where they want to rest how long they want to rest for what what do they want to rest on um giving them the options and not and that's where we come back to that coercive isn't it it's like well if they want to rest they've got the they've got the crate if we're going to use the crate as an example but it's like about giving those options and choice that like maybe it's a bit hot they don't want to go there but we're asking them and they're going to do it because they've trained we've trained them to like the crate it's that kind of thing um and that's not hating on crates because i use one myself but it's just it's that making sure that we we don't control everything to the nth degree so like we already decide what they eat when they eat how much they eat you know and, and you know what do they eat at all how long they have outside the house what we do on the outside of the house you know it's all these all these things is is it's fine but giving as much agency within that fishbowl as possible and encouraging them to fulfill their natural behaviors allowing them to be dogs essentially um encourages experiential learning uh, it's based in consent so that asking not telling uh, and avoids pressure and coercion based uh, which is self-explanatory anything else you want to add to benevolent guidance no 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 that's great uh and then i think we've got canine responsive practice so this for me is a little bit more of the practical side of of it um so accepting 
where the dog is at and their limitations. So that's only re-evaluating our expectations um, of the dog, kind of like what you were saying, Andy, there were. So I think I said to you about, I, I saw, saw a thing on Facebook and it was, I want my dog to like water. So I'm gonna make them like water by doing this, this and this. It was all positive. What if the dog ultimately doesn't like water, then we're still making them do something that they don't wanna do uh, necessarily. Um, and if we talk about Podrick, so he he struggles, he, he's dog selective essentially. He, he has his mates, he's fine, he's happy with his mates, doesn't particularly want to make new friends, um, and that's fine. But that means that, okay, what, when I got a dog, maybe I wanted to be able to go to the pub with the dog, maybe I wanted to go to those nice dog shows, all the stores and the fun dog shows, etc. And I can't do that. It's okay, it's about, and it's not about just being, being like, oh, well, you can't, you know, can't grieve for that or whatever you can. It's not, that's what being trauma informed at the other end, the human end is as well. But it's that like acceptance ultimately that I'm not going to make him do something that he's not comfortable with, just like how I wouldn't want anyone to make me feel uncomfortable. So it's accepting that right now he might not be able to do that. In the future, he might be able to do that. But if ultimately he can never do that, I'm not going to, make him, or I'm not going to live him any less, or I'm not going to continue to keep tra training and training and training in order to get to an end goal that doesn't exist. Um, it just exists in, in, the, in the pet parent's mind as, as that dream. So it's accepting the individual dog, what they can do on their limitations. Uh, protects, against and, protects against and supports through negative experiences. We're going to come on to negative experiences, but essentially we're talking now about uh, potential potentially traumatic experiences that ha that may have a long-lasting impact on dogs providing um, emotional physical and environmental safety and security minimizes re-traumatization where possible so you know things like flooding um, as a method of getting them comfortable <laughs> inverted commas um, with say a trigger is actually re-traumatizing them so it's some work you might have to do. So when I work with human survivors of trauma, there's always going to be an element of re-traumatization. But it's about, that's why we say minimizing. So as much as possible, we avoid re-traumatizing that, um, that person or that animal. Focuses on build, building resilience and building and recognizing the resilience that the dog already has. Um, a bit like I said with the human, um, the human model that we use where we, we talk about strength based so we recognize the resilience that they already have and the choices that they make that that serve them and we recognize that as actually um you know a, a, a strength it's the same so we recognize in dogs what resilience they already have and then as far as we can and within the limitations of the dog we build on that resilience uh, similarly we build regulation we make sure uh, we have realistic expectations. We provide relief um, where that, when they need it or try to meaning it or when they ask for it. And we operate through everything that we do through an empathetic lens. I think even the title of this kind of wedge, if you want to call it that. Um, segment. <laughs> segment, sorry, uh, is uh, yeah, canine responsive practice. I love that. I think. I think this is where we should be working towards canine responsive. I think it's just, uh, even with training for me, everything we ask, everything we look for is, is a request ultimately. And we yeah. have to wait for feedback. We just have to wait for that feedback. That feedback might be nothing. Uh, and we shouldn't see everything then as being uh, the kind of drive to do more. Okay, well, I didn't get it this time, so I need to up the reinforcer or all these kind of things. Because there could be a real reason why the dog can't do more at this moment. And we just have to be better at the nuances and the subtleties of it and not make everything a training issue. Yeah. So I love that canine responsive practice. I love that. I think it's great. I think we should all be canine responsive practitioners, uh, even. Uh, I think that's a great title. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I took that. It's basically just taken straight from trauma responsive practice in humans. I just changed like one word of it. Yep. Um, to, to That's what I did with dog centered care because that really yeah, exactly. is based on child centered care or patient centered care. It's the same thing, really. Just yeah, so excuse the pun, it. but I'm not reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Taking it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then uh, we've got understand the impact of negative experiences. So there we're talking about trauma. Um, but lots of people get uncomfortable with the term trauma because there's lots of 
people have different understandings of trauma and what that means and what it is lots of people think it's only the big things that count when actually there's lots of um things that can be traumatic it's individual um so instead of calling it trauma i've called it negative experiences because it's quite a little bit easier for people to grasp but essentially what we're talking about there is understanding the impact of, neg of trauma so um knowledge of the potential causes of negative experiences so some of the common shared ones um that that might be there um that might cause trauma knowledge of the different types of trauma and it's not about knowing in depth neuro you know neuroscience neurobiology brain all that brain stuff it's not we're not going to ask you it's not like a test like oh you know what's an amygdala what does hippocampus do? it's not about that i'm not not saying they need to know in depth everything it's just having a general understanding of the different types of trauma because the response will matter depending on the type of trauma that it is so things like acute so the different types of acute complex chronic developmental system generated so i think for me system generated is one that's missed a lot when we talk about dog training and that is the damage that we do as not me because i'm not a behaviors or a trainer but that some trainers actually do themselves so that's just that system generated so how we contribute to a trauma that's already there that's having that that's not having that self-awareness um and ultimately trauma is the over uh, 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 the individual's ability to cope has been overwhelmed um so that's the common denominator between all the different types is that they, they they're overwhelmed they can't cope but depending on what's happened um it might fall into the different categories of trauma uh, knowledge is a common trauma, uh, common responses to negative experiences. So that's where the five Fs come in, fight, flight, freeze, fall, and fall. Um, and language focuses on describing the behaviour rather than labelling dogs. So, you know, things like aggression and reactive. And not, again, it's not about language is bad or not, it's just thinking about the connotation, not the language that we use. Actually, what is the behavior and the reason for the behavior rather than focusing on the actual perception of the behavior and you talk about that all the time i <laughs> i think it's really important i think uh this is that notion of supported awareness again that yeah we have to go through because uh we kind of demonize dogs uh and that's kind of supported by the language we use around them and the labels we use and um and i think we, we have to kind of be especially as a professional really mindful about the language we choose. We need to meet people where they are with their own language and their own vocabulary and their own perceptions. You know, that's important, but we should also be really mindful about the language we use in response because uh, that's really important. We can feed into those labels if we're not careful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then lastly on the partnership wheel is appreciating the individuality of the dog. So, Ooh, is there one more? Yeah. Um, so respecting that the dog that's in front of you is a unique being. So if we if we looked at it through the the legs model, the Kimbrough's legs model, this is the self, the S of the legs. So um, recognizing that their past, uh, you know, that that how they've been brought up, that their, their personality is individual to them. That is not another carbon copy of your dog anywhere else on the planet. Even their sibling who has the same genetic makeup will have maybe a slightly different uh, personality and it's appreciating that and recognizing that and loving them for that um understanding behavior as an expression of need and self which is lifted from uh, you actually um but recognizing their preferred learning style um recognizing their individual resilience levels recognizing their previous learning history uh, recognizing any previous traumatic experiences or negative experiences that they've had appreciates the dog's environmental preferences so these are all like this is basically talking about the quirks that we all know that our individual dogs have so you know one dog really likes soft squeaky toys and the other dog really likes hard toys the same breed etc that's like a individual difference um appreciates uh breed and genetic heritage um, and what that might mean for behavior um age health and well-being of the dog so we know that that's going to matter uh, when we look at behavior so are they healthy what's their nutrition like what's their internal well-being like um, and in terms of expectations that matters too 
the sex of the dog and the horm and hormones that they have um, and you know whether they're neutered or intact all those kinds of things that all builds into the individual individuality of the dog um, and then their ability um, so that's thinking about things like do they have special educational needs so do they uh, are they blind do they have hearing loss do they have a physical disability um, or a mental um, um, impairment that they need support through so just looking really honing in on the individuality of uh, the specific dog that you're working with so that's the partnership wheel um, I really love it but I'm biased <laughs> I think again it reminds us of how many different component parts there are here and also how how much richness for the individual we can yeah. end up bypassing when we're stuck on the compliance wheel yeah uh and i think that's just really important that's why you know you and i we talk about the emotional experience a lot uh, and how unique that is to the individual and and, and uh a lot of what we've done in recent years with dogs especially on the science side of things is look at dogs uh, generally yeah, yeah um this reminds us about the importance of looking at the individual in front of us and and also an individual that can be different today to yesterday yeah uh, and i think that's really important you know um you know watching molly growing up and just seeing how she wasn't interested in certain things at some point at some certain stages but now she is and, and also things that she was interested in she's not anymore uh, yeah. and every day we're just inviting Molly to let us know where you at today what do you want to do how do you need to learn and grow rather than have a set criteria of stuff that we expect her to do yeah so it goes back to those checklists that lots of pet parents who panic about getting it right they're so you know that these checklists exist and it, it and they're so focused on that than learning the, the, the individuality of the dog. Um, but, but Podrick is a really good example because he's, he's a border collie, but I've always said he's a, a golden retriever in collie clothing because his personality is very chilled, laid back. I'm not, again, not generalizing <laughs> golden retrievers, but he's not got, he's not intense like some border collies are. He's, he's, he's got breed traits, but he's, He's not, he's himself, he's only him. You know, when I got a border collie, I had a, a view of this is what it is. Like lo lots of paired parents do, you know, you get told, well, border collies, they need to be run this amount of time, uh, this amount of time each day, or they like wreck your house and uh, they nip the, the, your heels and they have real problems, um, you know, herding things. Po project, I, honestly, I can't remember a time he ever nipped my ankles. Li literally, I'm not just making that up, I cannot physically remember. He never herded the cats. He doesn't have a strong like herding instinct at all. He probably would have failed being a sheepdog. Um, he he's just him, um, but he doesn't fit a lot of the traits that we're told that they have. So and then that might confuse the pet parent because they're like, well, you're not fitting. Like you were saying about the round, the square pegs in round hole. That you're not fitting what I thought you would be. And then panicking and thinking, well, you need to be that, so I'm going to train you to be that. And also, I think there's a, a deconstructed element of this where we, you know, the over kind of focus on must make sure my young dog is trained and I, th they have to do this, they have to do that. And overlooking some of that dog's core care and support needs, which creates more elevation in the dog, which creates more stress, which then creates the problems that we are often told, if you don't do this amount of stuff, you're gonna have these problems. Well, maybe, yeah. question mark, some of the problems wouldn't be there if we allowed a more natural way for that dog to be able to go through that experimental learning uh, rather than yeah. all the structured learning. Yeah. And that's definitely what we found with, with Molly and you found that with Podrick. I think allowing them to be, and that's learning from the young dog first and learning about how they need to learn and how they need to process things, especially social processing, all these kind of things that the, the pups got to tell us, you know? I think I was very lucky as well in that the people that I surrounded myself with were, happy and able to tell me when I was when I was putting too much pressure on so I remember very clearly a conversation with Trisha where I was like doing literally all the things that you you should like you shouldn't really do so I was like right you need, you need to have two hours of walks a day and I was doing like hoopers with him I was doing agility with him I was doing sheep herding with him and she just said you need to like just scale it back because you're going to make a rod for your own back where you know he's super fit he's going to expect all of this and on days when you can't do it he's not going to be able to rest um and because I listened and I was self-aware enough to 
understand and, and give time to people that had more knowledge than me I was then able to kind of cut off some of the damage that I could have could have done without their their um, kind of input um so I think it, that that's important as well as is um it's again it just always comes back to self-awareness I think and I think also uh, part of compliance is this notion of expectation um, yeah, yeah. because things have to fit into something. And um, uh, and that's there's a lot of pressure on that for new dog parents with that young puppy. And, uh, you know, I think we have to be better at educating the general public about just having the time, slowing things down, learning from your pup, building things up, making sure that that dog is able to learn the things it needs to learn in order to be better at self-regulation and uh, and to find those times where the dog can turn off and um and learning things you know, when molly came she was really up and high and and very bitey and very stressy um yeah. uh, and uh the expectation was on us to learn from her where that was coming from rather than trying to kind of manipulate some of that through a training model directly um yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's important and like, that's why uh, these wheels are important as well, because they just remind us of these things uh, about yeah. where we are within those wheels. Yeah, yeah I was just thinking as you were speaking, like that the biggest thing I ever did, best and biggest thing I ever did for Pod was just like, just letting him rest. <laughs> and that's not even a training thing, because like, so many of the behaviours that he was exhibiting, like jumping up, being very excitable, he just needed more sleep because I was trying to do all these check all these things that I was being told with him. He didn't need that. He just needed to sleep. <laughs> and process what he had learned, but I wasn't letting him. Um, and I think that's a lot of the thing as well. So, so then then I might, if I hadn't had people to tell me, oh, just let him rest, literally just do that. Then I might go to a trainer and say, he's jumping up loads and he's biting and he's like doing all these things, you know? Um, and, then, and then if they're, you know, depending on what training, they might go, okay, well, you need to, you know, every every time he jumps up, you need to turn your back and all these things. Well, actually, he just needs to sleep. Um, <laughs> So again, I think it's important because with Molly, you know, uh, if ever when she was young as a pup and she started to try and grab the lead or uh, she started to get a bit more bitey or more jumpy uppy, those were clear signs to us that she was in that kind of elevated state, that she, yeah. that she was struggling with something or some kind of overwhelmment there from a sensory integratory point of view. Uh, and managing those situations was what stopped all those things. We didn't have to kind of train alternatives. We just had to be really mindful about when those situations were more likely to happen, especially when we were out in the environment, because one of the big things we learned about Molly was she had very specific, even at an early age, uh, social processing preferences. And, and she was just having social engagement put on her all the time and she couldn't deal with it. Uh, so then she started to associate the wild, wider social environment with that. So we had to kind of just slow stuff down and get her to realise that actually you can do your processing and, uh, yeah. and not feel under the social, the social pressure that she was under. Okay, great. So let's build upon these wheels then. Let's, um... So the last one, last one is the extended partnership wheel and it mirrors the extended compliance wheel. So the institutions are the same, the uh, internal components are the same, the culture is slightly different and this is like the work in progress, I suppose. So I think I described this as the, where we want to get to and we're not there now, we're not there yet, but things like, and I shared this one in the group, so um, it still has the thing, some of the things on there that are on the um, the other culture wheel. But essentially, what we want is, as for you as practitioners and for us as do, uh, passionate pet parents, is to stay curious and have an open mind and run everything through that internal lens. Uh, tools and equipment are on there because they're just always going to be there. Um, slows down, which you talked about. Trust, um, building a culture of trust building boundaries or respecting boundaries, being holistic in our approach. So we don't just look at everything a behavior needs through one specific approach. We, we look at the dog holistically and we look at the factors that are feeding into the behavior in a holistic way. It's reflective. We hold ourselves accountable. It's trauma-informed. It's dog-centered always. So the dog is always at the center of everything we do. Um, and then language and values. Is, is is on there as it is on the other other wheel as well. A really important word there is is the word reflective. Yeah. Because because you have to, in order to truly be reflective, two things have to happen. One is you have to kind of slow down. You have to you have to kind of allow that 
time to be reflective. And also you have to be well regulated yourself. Yeah. Uh, to really be in that kind of like reflective state. So it's really a really important uh, word, I think. And I think um, this really does mirror well the importance of these extended wheels, because as the kind of the end user, if you like, the person with the dog, regardless of how you've done it, uh, your, your emphasis on either the compliance wheel or the partnership wheel will have been influenced by so many different factors. Yeah. Yeah, and we're not, we're just not there yet with with the culture element of it because because when we you know we spoke about with the extended compliance well about the influence when we still have for so for every um, like say you know behaviors that I follow that I want to follow because I believe in their ethos and their ethics for every one of them there's five of someone that I don't want to watch or I don't want to or is spouting. Um, things that I don't I don't agree with or, or that isn't on this on the partnership type of wheels and until we can kind of as a culture rebalance that it's going to be it's going to be you know hard um, so I think it, it is about some things we can do as individuals and some things are bigger than us as individuals um, and re recognizing all of our limitations as well when we're engaging with this specific conversation. And I think what this shows really for me is uh, on a kind of a base level, the, the importance of, of understanding more, recognizing there's more, but also um, it, it helps us to realize what a lot of these new, or I said, I don't use the word new necessarily, but anyway, a lot of these discussions are about because um, uh, what, which wheel you end up being on is very much based upon your initial outlook of the results and the criteria for those results that you start with. Yeah. And that can be just the same with positive training. And I think there's, um, uh, this is why we have to be reflective. And I think we all need to, I, when I look at the compliance wheel, there's a couple of things there for me. Um, I kind of touched on this earlier, but one is, is recognizing when I'm in that compliance wheel and I'm there consciously, and I think, okay, well, do you know, this is kind of something I need you to do, but I'm being truthful about it. And I'm just recognizing that I'm kind of following something through based on my narrative and my objective, mm -hmm. but also recognizing, and this is the hard bit actually, when we slip into that compliance world where we're not aware of it so much, that's the kind of the unconscious thing you're talking about. And uh, a lot of these discussions that we're having, especially in Dog Center Care, is recognizing that uh, just because we do things in a more progressive way doesn't necessarily mean we've come out of the compliance wheel. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing that we have to just bear in mind for us. Yeah. Because I and think, this, yeah, you're right. This, I was just gonna say one thing, and it's not a right and wrong wheel. I think that's yeah. important. Yeah. It's not, this is not a good, bad wheel, right, wrong meal, wheel. This is just recognizing which end of that kind of power control thing we're, we're handling, really, yeah. whether it's about our criteria based results led element or whether we're genuinely in that partnership which is okay can we make this work what do you need what do i need how do we work this forwards yeah 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 I, I, essentially that, that that is exactly it um i love so how trisha trisha says here that she loves this wheel it's the wheel of hope yeah i loved her comment i think that yeah that's it that is what it is for me as well um, it's, the, it's what we want, we aim for the future. And this isn't just for dogs. I think we have to recognize as, as a professional about making sure that when we're working with others, we're looking at more of that partnership will. Uh, I see the word compliance used a lot, you know, how to get compliance from your client, how to ensure compliance, whose responsibility for compliance. We, we're still using that word, even when we're thinking about getting another human being to do stuff. Yeah. Without recognizing all these things that are important for the human as well, that person, there could be many reasons why that client can't do those things. And it's not, we, we make a presumption that they won't, but there could be a, a, so many reasons why they can't. And some of that comes back to this trauma informed yeah. approach as well. And it, it has to be an invitation to, you know, I'm going to invite you to think about this. That's why I like the phrase supported awareness. 
because yeah. it's a support it was supporting somebody to become more aware of their dog's care and support needs um but uh again if we're stuck in task that task orientation then we can we get stuck back into that compliance again which is uh you know how do i get my client to do this stuff without yeah. finding out in the first place whether they can even do it yeah what, what, what the barriers i think lo lo lots of people have um like quite rigid if a person comes to me and their dog is doing this, this is my approach and this is how I've always done it and this is how I'll always do it. But the human, there's no, that's what I tried to say earlier, like what you're saying is the human side matters as well, because that's actually the engagement that you need in order to create change. Um, and I was, I think I was saying to you about it, you need to, sometimes it needs to be a lot more gentle and non-judgmental than sometimes I see it being, um, because of, what I do in my my day job which is training people like like the police social services people with very rigid very limiting backgrounds in how they're trained or, uh, to look at something especially with trauma if I go in and I just say well you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong and you're wrong are they that just closes people down it doesn't mm -hmm. allow them to be reflected or it doesn't create a safe space for the human so we can't grow if there's no safe. If we're saying for dogs, well, they can't. We can't get what we need because they're not in a safe space. But you're not creating a safe space for the human to feel safe to tell you that they weren't able to do something or they weren't able to do it to the standard that you want. Then you're not. Then you're actually just going to shut people down just as much, and then that affects the dog. Um, so it's about having. I'm not saying we. It's gently, gently catchy monkey is what what we used to say but it's ge gently gently that doesn't mean you can't challenge people but challenge people in a way that is safe for everyone involved and I do think that when I look at the structure of some of the you know so, some of the behaviorists that go on certain trainings that's missing from your training in a way that the human part so you do a lot of work you do a lot of like dogs do this because of this and the science blah, blah, blah. But there's no like human parts, so, like how to speak with humans in a trauma, how to support humans who are struggling, you know, with what you're asking them to do. There doesn't seem to be like modules on that. And I feel like that's a real shame because that will kind of handicap you in your mm. ability to effectively support the dog. I agree. And I think, you know, some of the things that I, I can only talk about the kind of stuff that I put out, but my, my uh, unpacking the emotional experience workshop that you've been on. Uh, there's some core elements there on the psychology of some of this stuff and I think it should be integral because if you're communicating to another you need to understand about how their own value system and belief systems filters that information and and, um, uh, and definitely what you just said there resonates a lot even with how we discuss with things because if we're not careful and this happens a lot in our in our industry in our community we have lots of little islands being made where nobody can get to each other's island now because uh because people take a very absolutist view on something and having an absolutist view is, is in itself not a problem I, I i have some absolutist views of my own uh um but it's when we start making that as a barrier to communication to discuss with others to find middle ground and especially those people who want to shift their awareness or shift their view uh they might not be ready to make that big leap from doing something to not doing something they might they might want to find graduated ways of doing that along the path and that's what we try to do in dog center care of course with the discussions and most of the time the discussions are uh passionate but civil and i think that's the point i think we can find that and uh we're all trying to navigate best how we become more available to that emotional truth of another that whether that's the human or the dog and there will be not, there won't be one approach for that. This is the point, you know, we, we can feel I've, I've got the way or this is the approach, but and ultimately we need to invite people to take the individual strands that help them for their own way of understanding things, I think. Yeah. And that's what I love about this model because it's just there in a very simple way, in a non-judgmental way. I'm mm -hmm. just looking about the two aspects, the compliance and the partnership and the different influences on those and actually how hard it can be to shift away from some of the compliance stuff, actually, when you think about a lot of the contributory, contributory factors that surround that side of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it just, it always comes back to the asking. So especially with the humans, I remember when I, cause I no longer work frontline, but when I did, it was like, oh, we have, we've had a session, you know, you might not, they might not be able to remember everything because if, if they're emotionally charged, we know that that affects memory. 
Um, it's, it's the same with someone comes to you that, with their dog and they're upset because they're, because of what's happening with the dog. You go through with them, you know, like lots of like, little bits that they need to do. They might not remember. So I always ask my clients at, at the end of the session, like, do you need me to write this down? Do you want this to be sent in an email? Do you want to have a catch, a, you know, a phone call in a week's time to go back over it? You know, is it safe for you to take this home kind of thing? But I think it's that it's that element as well um, to being trauma informed is if we, we can't always rely on us just speaking at people and them absorbing it, uh, which is why, as I said, the reason I made the wheels is as a visual learner, it's a lot easier for, for me, for certain people to see it. I think that's important. I think um, yeah, when uh, uh, I, I was discussing at the workshop with Holly and Laura that you came to about social evaluative threat and about yeah. how our brain is always looking for, you know, looking to not be judged and, um, and what that does to us and our ability to be able to process and to be able to think kind of cognitively. Um, a lot of our clients are in that state when they're with us and we've got to be really careful about the language we use and how we help navigate what they're doing, I think. Uh, I think it's really important for them. Uh, okay, right, so um, let's have a look. So uh, I'll just throw this over to people in the, in the room, really, if there's anybody who's got any questions they'd like to ask um, based on Maya's presentation of her wheels, then please do. Um, yeah, I'd like to, it will hang on uh, for about 10 minutes. And um, if people have questions, they can pop them in now and, and we can, uh, and you know, I can just waffle and if no one has any. Um, yeah. But I was just really passionate. If, if people have questions live, then I'd like to answer them live if, if we can. Um, so please do. No questions, silly. <laughs> no, no questions, silly. Uh, a lot of really supportive comments in the group, uh, Maya. And um, uh, I think this is going to be a case of, uh, we'll have to keep an eye on the thread, I think, and then uh, maybe put some things in the group and see what uh, what things get, get raised there. We could always do a, a quick little live together um, yeah we could yeah that's right yeah and just go through some things together then and, and answer some of those questions i think um uh as we said you know if people if people have a specific interest in one section or one wheel we can always get back together and do an in-depth look at you know that specifically if people yeah. are interested so uh the only other thing i was gonna say is i will um now that they've been kind of launched and this is recorded um, talk, there's this explanation to the wheel. So I will put some uh, images, the actual wheels as uh, there's, I've got PDF forms format and also JPG format. So if people want to see them, um, I'll put them in the group and you can just share, you can do whatever you want to do with them, um, share them, uh, save them, share them with your friends, share them with your clients, whatever um so so that they'll they'll be free to use and they'll go up people that have um if they they can't if if you were just to see them it can be a little bit hard to understand them so that's why the recorded um the recording will come in handy so i can say you know people can go to the youtube link to to see the introduction to them and Zoe says, um, this is awesome, Karen, when can we quote this? I think I think you covered that there, Mayorish. I think you can, uh, we'll, we'll get the material put in the group, Zoe, and you can use it in yeah. whatever way you feel is helpful for you with however you need to communicate this to whoever. Really. I think that's really And I've important. got an email address now by your request. So if people have yeah. specific questions, um, they can pop me an email um, through that, through the email that's on there, and yeah. it will be on the thing. Um, yeah. Great. And then uh, Marilyn says, do we have a puppy protocol based on the wheels? I think, uh, that's, I think cool. that's a really interesting question. <laughs> yeah. I think we, that can be looked at. Remember, this is all new and uh, and it's very much evolving. I think there's a lot in the two wheels that are really applicable to puppies anyway. I think, um, but I think that's something for us to think about. I think that, that we could definitely kind of kind of home in on on the puppy side of things. Uh, Maya, that's uh, that's a good good idea. Um, Catherine. Uh, I'd be interested to know more about trauma from the dog's perspective, particularly with my rescue dog. Well, that's great. And I think um, uh, Rachel- Well, I've referenced, mm. I've, I've referenced people so specifically for that reason where people are interested in certain aspects. So yeah, so Re Rachel Leather's the one that I tend to reference. Yeah, and Holly, and I think uh, Rachel's got her own trauma group. Uh, Catherine, I don't really know about that. Uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head now. Do you know it's, what I mean? uh, Dogs impacted by trauma. Dogs impacted by trauma, yeah, and that's well worth uh, looking at that. Um, and, and also, Polycat. 
and Holly Tet as well with um, kindness is essential, not optional. Kindness is yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, and of course, Daniela Beck, of course, uh, yeah. with um, control the uh, uh, control, control the yeah. Yes, yes, brilliant. So look at those things. Um, and also, uh, if you haven't seen it, Catherine Rachel Leather did a, a, a dog centered care chat with me like this. It's in it's on the YouTube channel as it did Holly Tet. Um, uh, and Daniela's coming in. The dogs into care group soon as well, so that's good for us. Um, just to say to everybody that uh, just for scheduling issues, we've had to postpone Maya's next chat in the group, which is going to be a part two to the one that uh, Maya did a few weeks ago, but that will be rearranged soon, so just keep an eye open for that. Um, we've got uh, let's have a look here. I've only just come back from holidays, I say, so I'm still. <laughs> Still trying to work things out in my head. Who we got coming soon? Uh, we've got the wonderful Sandy Sharma coming up uh, on July the 3rd. Um, and then we've got another uh, Rob Faulkner Taylor. Robert Faulkner Taylor's got another uh, chat on July the 5th. Uh, but I'll make sure I put everything into the events for everybody. Uh, well, that's been amazing, Mayor. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, uh, and I think everybody can appreciate the amount of work you put in and how you've tried to look at things through that kind of uh, that that neutral perspective really that's what I love about it and I think it's very accessible and, it's, and it really makes you think about what is it that we're actually doing in those engagement moments with our dogs and and, and, um, and what element of that kind of uh, that perspective based element of regarding the results and the criteria are we are we focusing in on yeah Thank, well, and thank you for having me. <laughs> well, it's always a great pleasure. I'm, I'm a big fan, as you know. Uh, and, and thanks for coming. So great. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for watching in tonight. And uh, this will be up on the YouTube channel. And when it is, uh, feel free to share it. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks very much, mate. I'll speak to you soon. Thank Good night, you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye.